Today I'd like to talk about Go, um, which is interesting, especially interesting for us in this course, because of course Go is the language that the labs, you're all gonna do the labs in. And so I wanna focus today particularly on um, some of the machinery that's sort of most useful in the labs and in um, most particular to distributed programming. Um, first of all, uh, you know, it's worth asking why we use Go in this class. Um, in fact, we could have used any one of a number of other system style languages. There's plenty of languages like Java or C Sharp or even Python that provide the kind of uh, facilities we need. And indeed, we used to use C++ in this class and it, it worked out fine. Um, you know, Go, indeed like many other languages, provides a bunch of features which are particularly convenient. That's good support for threads and locking and synchronization between threads, um, which we use a lot. It is a convenient remote procedure call package, which um, doesn't sound like much, but it actually turns out to be a significant constraint. Um, it, uh, for many languages like C++, for example, it's actually a bit hard to find a, a convenient, easy to use remote procedure call package. And of course, we use it all the time in this course for uh, programs and different machines to talk to each other. Um, unlike C++, Go is type safe and memory safe. That is, it's pretty hard to write a program that due to a bug, scribbles over some random piece of memory and then causes the program to do mysterious things. Um, and that just eliminates a big class of bugs. Similarly, it's garbage collected, which means um, you're never in danger of freeing the same memory twice or free memory that's still in use or something because the garbage collector just frees things um, and they stop being used. And one thing that's maybe not obvious until you've played around with this, this kind of programming before, but the combination of threads and garbage collection is particularly important. Um, one of the things that goes wrong in a non-garbage collected language like C++, if you use threads, is that it's always a bit of a puzzle and requires a bunch of book bookkeeping to figure out when the last thread that's using a shared object has finished using that object, because only then can you free the object. And so you end up writing quite a bit of code to like manually, the programmer writes a bunch of code to manually you know, do reference counting or something in order to figure out you know, when the last thread stopped using an object. And that's just a pain, um, and that problem completely goes away if you use garbage collection like we have in Go. Um, and finally, the language is simple, much simpler than C++. One of the problems with using C++ is that um, often if you made an error, you know, maybe even just a typo, the, um, the error message you get back from the compiler is so complicated that in C++, it's usually not worth trying to figure out what the error message meant. Um, and I find it's always just much quicker to go look at the line number and try to guess what the error must have been because the language is just far too complicated. Whereas Go is, you know, probably doesn't have a lot of people's favorite features, um, but it's a relatively straightforward language. Okay, so at this point, you've all done the tutorial. Um, if you're looking for sort of, you know, what to look at next to learn about the language, um, a good place to look is the document titled Effective Go, which you, know, you can find by searching the web. All right, um, the first thing I wanna talk about is threads. Um, the reason why we care a lot about threads in this course is that um, threads are the sort of main tool we're gonna be using to manage concurrency in programs. And concurrency is a particular interest in distributed programming because it's often the case that um, one program actually needs to talk to a bunch of other computers. You know, a client may talk to many servers or a server may be serving requests at the same time on behalf of many different clients. And so we need a way to say, oh, you know, I'm, my program really has seven different things going on because it's talking to seven different clients um, and I want a simple way to, to allow it to do these seven different things, you know, without too much complex programming. Um, and so for us, threads are the answer. So these are the things that the Go documentation calls Go routines, um, which I call threads. Their Go routines are really the same as what everybody else calls threads. Um, so the way to think of threads is that um, you have a program, you have one program, um, and one address space. So I'm gonna draw a box to sort of um, denote an address space, and within that address space in a serial program um, without threads, you just have one thread of execution executing code in that address space. Um, one program counter, one set of registers, one stack. 
that are sort of describing the current state of the execution. In a threaded program, like a Go program, you can have multiple threads. And um, you know, I gotta draw it as multiple squiggly lines, and what each line represents really is um, a separate, if the, especially if the threads are executing at the same time, but um, a separate program counter, a separate set of registers, and a separate stack um, for each of the threads so that they can have a sort of their own thread of control and be executing each thread in a different part of the program. Um, and so hidden here is that for every stack, you know, there's a, so every thread, there's a stack that it's executing on. Um, uh, the, the stacks are actually in the, in the one address space of the program. So even though each, stack, each thread has its own stack, technically um, the, uh, they're all in the same address space and different threads could refer to each other's stacks if they knew the right addresses, um, although you typically don't do that. Um, and in Go, when you, even the main program, you know, when you first start off the program and it runs in main, that's also, it's just a Go routine. It can do all the things that Go routines can do. Um, all right. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the big reasons is, is um, to allow uh, different parts of the program to sort of be in its own point in, in a different activity. So I usually refer to that as I.O. concurrency for um, historical reasons. And um, the reason I call it I.O. concurrency is that in the old days where this first came up is that, oh, you might have one thread that's waiting to read from the disk. And while it's waiting to read from the disk, you'd like to have a second thread that maybe can compute or read somewhere else on the disk or send a message in the network and wait for a reply. Um, so, and so I.O. concurrency is one of the things that threads buy you. Um, for us, it will usually mean I can, I.O. concurrency will usually mean I can have one program that has launched remote procedure calls, requests to different servers on the network, and is waiting for many replies at the same time. That, that's how it'll come up for us. Um, and you know, the way you would do that with threads is that you would create one thread for each of the remote procedure calls that you wanted to launch. That thread would have code that you know, sent the remote procedure call request message um, and sort of waited at this point in the thread. And then finally, when the reply came back, the thread would continue executing. Um, and using threads allows us to have multiple threads that all launch requests into the network at the same time. They all wait, or they don't have to do it at the same time. They can you know, execute the different parts of this whenever they feel like it. So that's I.O. concurrency, sort of overlapping of um, the progress of different activities um, and allowing, while one activity is waiting, other activities can proceed. Um, another big reason to use threads is uh, multi-core parallelism, which I'll just call parallelism. Um, and here the thing we're, we'd be trying to achieve with threads is if you have a multi-core machine, like I'm sure all of you do in your laptops, if you have a sort of compute heavy job that needs a lot of CPU cycles, wouldn't it be nice if you could have one program that could use uh, CPU cycles on all of the cores of the machine? And indeed, if you write a multi-threaded Go, if you launch multiple Go routines in Go and they do something compute intensive, like sit there in a loop and you know, compute digits of pi or something, um, then up to the limit of the number of cores in the physical machine, um, your threads will run truly in parallel. And if you launch you know, two threads instead of one, you'll get twice as many, uh, you'll be able to use twice as many CPU cycles per second. Um, so this is very important to some people. Um, it's not a big deal in this course. There'll be, it's rare that we'll sort of think specifically about this kind of parallelism. In the real world, though, of building things like servers um, to, to form parts of a distributed system, it can sometimes be extremely important to be able to have the server be able to run threads and harness the CPU power of a lot of cores, just because the load from clients can often be pretty high. Um, OK, so parallelism is a second reason um, why threads are, are quite a bit of interest in distributed systems. And a third reason, which is maybe a little bit less important, is there's some, there's times when you really just want to be able to do something in the background, or you know, there's just something you need to do periodically, and you don't want to have to sort of in the main part of your program sort of insert checks to say, well, should I be doing this thing that should happen every second or so? You just like to be able to fire something up that every second does whatever the periodic thing is. So there's some convenience reasons. Um, and 
An example which will come up for you is um, it's often the case that some, you know, a master server may want to check periodically whether its workers are still alive because if one of them has died, you know, you want to launch that work on another machine, like MapReduce might do that. And one way to arrange sort of, oh, do this check every second, every minute, you know, send a message to the worker, are you alive, is to fire off a Go routine that just sits in a loop that sleeps for a second and then does the periodic thing and then sleeps for a second again. And so in the labs, you'll end up um, firing off these kind of threads quite a bit. Yes? Is the overhead worth it? Is the overhead worth it? Um, yes. <laughs> um, the, the overhead's really pretty small for this stuff. I mean, you know, it depends on how many. You, you create a million threads that each sit in a loop waiting for a millisecond and then send a network message. That's probably a huge load on your machine. But if you create, you know, 10 threads that sleep for a second and then do a little bit of work, it's probably not a big deal at all. And, and it's, I guarantee you, the programmer time you save by not having to sort of mush together sort of different loop, different activities into one line of code is, is worth the small amount of CPU cost, almost always. Um, still, you know, you will, if you're unlucky, you'll discover in the labs that some loop of yours is not sleeping long enough, or you fired off a bunch of these and never made them exit, for example, and they just accumulate, so. Um, you can push it too far. Okay, so these are the reasons, that, the main reasons that uh, people like threads a lot and that we'll use threads in this class. Any other questions about threads in general? Yes? So is there, what kind of similarities and differences are there between concurrent programming and asynchronous programming? By asynchronous programming, you mean like a single thread of control that keeps state about many different activities? Sure. Yeah, so this is a good question, actually. The, um, there is, you know, what would happen if we didn't have threads or we, for some reason we didn't want to use threads? Like, how would we be able to write a program that could, you know, a server that could talk to many different clients at the same time or a client that could talk to many servers, right? What, what tools could we use? And it turns out there is sort of um, another line of, uh, Another kind of, another major style of how you structure these programs called, you call it the asynchronous program, I might call it event-driven programming. Um, so, sort of, or you could use event-driven programming. And uh, the, the, the general structure of an event-driven program is usually that it has a single thread and a single loop. And what that loop does is sits there and waits for any input or sort of any event that might trigger processing. So an event might be the arrival of a request from a client or a timer going off. Um, or if you're building a window system, because many window systems on your laptops are driven, written in event-driven style where what they're waiting for is like key clicks or mouse movement or something. So you might have a single, in an event-driven program, you might have a single thread of control, sits in a loop, waits for input, and whenever it gets an input, like a packet, it figures out, oh, you know, which client did this packet come from? Um, and then it'll have a table of sort of what the state is of whatever activity um, it, it's managing for that client. Um, and it'll say, oh, gosh, I was in the middle of reading such and such a file. You know, now it's asked me to read the next block. I'll go and read the next block and return it. Um, and um, the, um, threads are generally more convenient <laughs> because they allow you to really you know, it, it's much easier to write sequential, just like straight line sequential code that does, you know, computes, sends a message, waits for a response, whatever. It's much easier to write that kind of code in a thread than it is to chop up um, whatever the activity is into a bunch of little pieces that can sort of be activated one at a time by one of these event-driven loops. Um, that said, the, uh, well, the, and so, one problem with the scheme is that it's, uh, it's a little bit of a pain to program. Another potential defect is that while you get I.O. concurrency from this approach, you don't get CPU parallelism. So if you're writing a busy server that would really like to keep you know, 32 cores busy on a big server machine, um, you know, a single loop is uh, you know, it's, it's not a very natural way to harness more than one core. Um, uh, on the other hand, the overheads of adventure and programming are generally quite a bit less than threads.
Um, you know, these threads are pretty cheap, but each one of these threads um, is sitting on a, a stack. You know, a stack is a kilobyte or eight kilobytes or something. You know, if you have 20 of these threads, who cares? If you have a million of these threads, then uh, it's starting to be a huge amount of memory. Um, and you know, the, the, maybe the scheduling bookkeeping for deciding what the thread to run next might also start. You know, you now have lists, scheduling lists with a thousand threads in them. Um, the threads can start to get quite expensive. So if you are in a position where you need to have a single server that serves you know, a million clients and has to sort of keep a little bit of state for each of a million clients, um, this could be expensive. And it's easier to write uh, a very, you know, at some expense in programmer time, it's easier to write a really stripped down, efficient, low overhead service in event-driven programming. It's just a lot more work. Language like JavaScript, right? You could write multiple event listeners. So, and those would be event driven. Is it, do they have multiple cores or is it just one thread? I mean, do they have multiple threads or is it just on one thread that everything happens? Are you asking about JavaScript? I don't know. <laughs> so the question is whether JavaScript has multiple cores executing your, does anybody know? Depends on the implementation, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's a natural thought, though. Even in, you know, even in Go, you might well want to have, if you knew your machine had eight cores, if you wanted to write the world's most efficient whatever server, you could fire up eight threads, and on each of the threads run a sort of stripped-down, event-driven loop, just you know, sort of one event loop per, per core. And that, you know, that would be a way to get both parallelism and uh, sort of IO concurrency. Yes? I'm wondering what's the difference between threads and processes and what resources it does both provide for each and eventually to which why are we talking about threads instead of processes? OK, so the question is, what's the difference between threads and processes? Um, so usually on a, like a Unix machine, a process um, is a single program that you're running and a sort of single address space, a single bunch of memory for the process. And inside a process, you might have multiple threads. So when you write a Go program and you run the Go program, running the Go program creates one Unix process and one sort of memory area. And then when your Go process creates Go routines, those are sort of sitting inside that one process. So um, I'm not sure if that's really an answer, but just historically, the operating systems have provided, like this big box is the process that's implemented by the operating system. And the individual, and sort of the operating system does not care what happens inside your process, what language you use, none of the operating system's business. Um, but inside that process, you can run lots of threads. Now, you know, if you run more than one process in your machine, you know, you run more than one program, like an editor or a compiler, the operating system keeps them quite separate, right? Your, your editor and your compiler each have memory, but it's not the same memory. They're not allowed to look at each other's memory. There's not much interaction between different processes. So your editor may have threads, and your compiler may have threads, but they're just in different worlds. So within any one program, the threads can share memory and can synchronize with channels and use mutexes and stuff. But between processes, there's just no, no interaction. Um, anyway, that's just the traditional structure of these, this kind of software. Yeah. So the question is, when a context switch happens, does it happen for all threads? Um, um, OK, so let's, let's imagine you have a single core machine that's really only running and is just doing one thing at a time. Um, maybe the right way to think about it is that you're going to be, you're running multiple processes on your machine. Um, the operating system will give the CPU sort of time slicing back and forth between these two programs. So when the hardware timer ticks and the operating system decides it's time to take away the CPU from the currently running process and give it to another process, that's done at a process level. Ah, it's complicated. <laughs> um, all right, let me, let, me re, let me restart this. These, the threads that we use are based on 
threads that are provided by the operating system in the end. And when the operating system context switches, it's switching between the threads that it knows about. So in a situation like this, the operating system might know that there were two threads here in this process and three threads in this process. And when the timer ticks, the operating system will, based on some scheduling algorithm, pick a different thread to run. It might be a different thread in this process or uh, one of the threads in this process. In addition, Go cleverly multiplex as many Go routines on top of single operating system threads to reduce overhead. So there's really probably a two stages of scheduling. The operating system picks which big thread to run, and then within that process, Go may have a choice of Go routines to run. Um, all right. OK, so um, threads are convenient because a lot of the time they allow you to write the code for each thread just as if it were a pretty ordinary sequential program. Um, however, there are, in fact, some challenges with uh, writing threaded code. Um, one is what to do about shared data. One of the really cool things about the threading model is that these threads share the same address space. They share memory. If one thread creates an object in memory, the, it can let other threads use it. Right? You can have an array or something that all the different threads are reading and writing. And that's sometimes critical. Right? If you, you know, if you're keeping some interesting state, you know, maybe you have a cache of things that you know, you're a server, you have a cache in memory. When a thread is handling a client request, it's going to first look in that cache. But it's a shared cache, and each thread reads it, and the threads may write the cache to update it um, when they have new information to stick in the cache. So it's really cool. You can share that memory. Um, but it turns out that it's very, very easy to get bugs um, if you're not careful and you're sharing memory between threads. And so a totally classic example. Um, is, you know, supposing your thread, supposing you have a global variable n that's shared among the different threads, and a thread just wants to increment n, right? By itself, this is likely um, to be an invitation to bugs, right, if you don't do anything special around this code. And the reason is that, you know, whenever you write code in a thread that you, you know is accessing, reading or writing data that's shared with other threads, you know, there's always the possibility, and you've got to keep in mind that some other thread may be looking at the data or uh, modifying the data at the same time. So the obvious problem with this is that maybe thread one is executing this code, and thread two is actually in the same function in a different thread executing the very same code, right? And remember, I'm imagining the n as a global variable, so they're talking about the same n. So what this boils down to, you know, you're not actually running this code, you're running some machine code the compiler produced. And what that machine code does is it, you know, it loads x into a register, you know, adds one um, to the register, and then stores that register into x, where x is the address of some location in RAM. So you know, you can count on both of the threads. They're both executing this line of code. You know, they both load the variable x into a register. Right? And if x starts out at 0, that means they both loaded 0. They both increment that register, so they get 1. And they both store 1 back to memory. And now two threads have incremented n, and the resulting value is 1. Right? Which, um, well, who knows what the programmer intended? Maybe that's what the programmer wanted. But chances are not. Right? Chances are the programmer wanted 2, not 1. In, in this case, when the instructions get compiled down to assembly, can we consider each line to be a comic? Some, uh, some instructions are atomic. So the question is a very good question, which um, it's, it's whether individual instructions are atomic. So the answer is some are and some aren't. So a store, a 32-bit um, store is likely to, extremely likely to be atomic, in the sense that if two processors store at the same time to the same memory address 32-bit values, what you'll end up with is either the 32 bits from one processor or the 32 bits from the other processor, but not a mixture. Other sizes, it's not so clear. Like one byte stores, that depends on the CPU you're using. Because a one byte store is really a, almost certainly a 32 byte load and then a, a modification of eight bits and then a 32 byte store. But it depends on the processor. And more complicated instructions like increment. You know, your microprocessor may well have an increment instruction that 
can directly increment some memory location, like pretty unlikely to be atomic, um, although there's atomic versions of some of these instructions. Yeah. So there's no, well, anyway. All right, so this is, this is a just classic danger, um, and it's usually called a race. It'll come up a lot because you're going to do a lot of threaded programming with shared state. Um, race, I think, refers to uh, some ancient class of bugs involving electronic circuits. Um, but for us, the, you know, the reason why it's called a race is because if one of the CPUs has started executing uh, this code, and the other one, the other thread is sort of getting close to this code, it's sort of a race as to whether the first processor can finish and get to the store before the second processor starts to ex execute the load. If the first processor actually manages to do the store before the second processor gets to the load, then the second processor will see the stored value, um, and the second processor will load one, add one to it, and store two. So, um, so that's how you can justify this terminology. Um, OK, and so the way you solve this, certainly something this simple, is you insert locks. You know, you, you, as a programmer, you have some um, strategy in mind for locking the data. You can say, well, you know, this uh, piece of shared data can only be used when such and such a lock is held. Um, and you'll see this, and you may have used this in the tutorial, um, the Go calls locks mutexes. So what you'll see is a mu.lock before um, a sequence of code that uses shared data and mu.unlock afterwards. And then whichever two threads execute this, whichever one is lucky enough to get the lock first, gets to do all this stuff and finish before the other one is allowed to proceed. Um, and so you can think of wrapping a, some code in a lock as making a bunch of, you know, remember this, even though it's one line, it's really three distinct operations. You can think of a lock as causing this sort of um, multi-step code sequence to be atomic with respect to other people who have the lock. Yes? Should you? So, so can you repeat the question? So, like, how does Go know which variable is issued? Oh. Anything that's touched? That's a great question. The question was, how does Go know which variable we're locking? <laughs> right here, of course, there's only one variable. But maybe we're saying n equals x plus y, really, three, three different variables. And the answer is that Go has no idea. Um, it's not, there's no association at all anywhere between this lock, so this mu thing is a variable, which is a type mutex. There's just, there's no association in the language between the lock and any variables. The association's in the programmer's head. So as a programmer, you need to say, oh, here's a bunch of shared data, and any time you modify any of it, you know, here's a complex data structure, say a tree or an expandable hash table or something. Anytime you're going to modify it, and of course a tree is composed of many, many objects. You know, anytime you're going to modify anything associated with this data structure, you have to hold such and such a lock. Right? And of course it's many objects, and the set of objects changes because you might allocate new tree nodes. Um, but it's really the programmer who sort of works out a strategy for ensuring that the data structure is used by only one core at a time. And sort of creates a, the, the one or maybe more locks. I mean, there's many locking strategies you could apply to a tree. You could imagine a tree with a lock for every tree node. Um, the programmer works out the strategy, allocates the locks, and keeps in the programmer's head the relationship to the data. But Go, for Go, it's, it's this, this lock, it's just like a very simple thing. There's a lock object. The first thread that calls lock gets the lock. Other threads have to wait until it unlocks, and that's all Go knows. Does it not lock all variables that are part of the object? Go doesn't know anything about the relationship between variables and locks. So when you acquire that lock, when you have code that um, calls lock, exactly what it is doing is acquiring this lock. And that's all this does. And anybody else who tries to, you know, there's lock objects. So somewhere else we would have declared, you know, mutex mu. 
right? And this mu refers to some particular lock object. And there may be many, many locks, right? And all this does is acquires this lock. And anybody else who wants to acquire it has to wait until we unlock this lock. Um, and that's totally up to us as programmers what we were protecting with that lock. Um, so the question is, is it better to have the lock be a private, um, the private business of the data structure? Like, supposing you're implementing map. Yeah. And, you know, you would hope, although it's not true, that map internally would have a lock protecting it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a reasonable strategy. Would be to have the, I mean, what would be to have the, uh, if you define a data structure, that needs to be locked to have the lock be sort of interior, that have each of the data structure's methods be responsible for acquiring that lock, and the user of the data structure may never know. That, that's pretty reasonable. And the, the only point at which that breaks down is that, um, well, it's a couple of things. One is, if the programmer knew that the data was never shared, they might be bummed that they were paying the lock overhead for something they knew didn't need to be locked. So that's one potential problem. Um, the other is, that if you, um, if there's any inter-data structure dependencies, so we have two data structures, each with locks, and one, and they maybe use each other, then um, there's a risk of cycles and deadlocks, right? And the deadlocks can be solved, but the usual solutions to deadlocks require lifting the locks out of the, out of the implementations up into the calling code. I will talk about that at some point, but it, it's not a, it's a good idea to hide the locks, but it's not always a good idea. All right. Okay, so one problem you run into with threads is, uh, is races, and generally you solve them with locks. Okay, or actually there's, there's two big strategies. One is you figure out some locking strategy um, for making access to the data single thread, one thread at a time, or you re uh, you fix your code to not share data. Um, if you can do that, it's, that's probably better because it's less complex. Um, all right, so a, a, another issue that shows up with uh, threads is called coordination. Um, when we're doing locking, the different threads involved probably have no idea that the other ones exist. They just want to like, be able to get at the data without anybody else interfering. Um, but there are also cases where you need, where you do intentionally want different threads to interact. I want to wait for you. Maybe you're producing some data. You know, you're a different thread than me. I, you're, you're producing data. I want to wait until you you've generated the data before I read it, right? Um, or you launch a bunch of threads to say crawl the web, and you want to wait for all those threads to finish. So there's times when we intentionally want uh, different threads to interact with each other, to wait for each other, um, and that's usually called coordination. Um, and there's a bunch of, as you, you probably know from having done the tutorial, there's a bunch of techniques in Go for doing this, like channels, um, which are really about sending data from one thread to another and waiting for the data to be sent. Um, there's also other stuff that, you know, more special purpose things, um, like there's a idea called condition variables which is great if there's some thread out there and you want to kick it period, you're not sure if the other thread's even waiting for you, but if it is waiting for you, you'd just like to give it a kick so it can, will know that it should continue whatever it's doing. Um, and then there's wait group, um, which is particularly good for launching a, a known number of Go routines and then waiting for them to all to finish. Um, and a final piece of damage that comes up with threads is deadlock. Um, the deadlock refers to the general problem that you sometimes run into where one thread, um, you know, thread, this thread is waiting for thread two to produce something. So, you know, let's draw an arrow to say thread one is waiting for thread two. Um, you know, for example, thread one may be waiting for thread two to release a lock or to send something on a channel or to, you know, decrement something on a, on a wait group. However, Unfortunately, maybe T2 is waiting for thread 
if you had one to do something. And this is particularly uh, common in the case of locks. So thread one acquires lock A, and thread two acquires lock B. Um, so thread one has acquired lock A, thread two has acquired lock B. Um, and then next, thread one needs to lock B also, that is, hold two locks, which sometimes shows up. And it just so happens that thread two needs to hold lock A. That's a deadlock, right? They'll each grab their first lock and then proceed down to where they need their second lock, and now they're waiting for each other forever, right? Neither of them can proceed, neither of them then can release the lock. Um, and usually just nothing happens. So if your program just kind of grinds to a halt and doesn't seem to be doing anything but didn't crash, uh, deadlock is, is one thing to check. Okay. All right, let's look at the, um, the web crawler uh, from the tutorial as an example of, of some of this threading stuff. Um, I have a couple of two solutions in different styles, or really three solutions um, in different styles to allow us to talk a bit about the details of some of this thread programming. Um, so first of all, you all probably know a web crawler. Its job is you give it the URL of a page that it starts at. And you know, many web pages have links to other pages. So what a web crawler is trying to do is you know, fetch the first page, extract all the URLs that were mentioned in that page's links, you know, fetch the pages they point to, look at all those pages for the URLs, URLs, all URLs that they refer to, and keep on going until it's fetched all the pages in the web, let's just say, um, and then it should stop. Um, in addition, the, uh, the graph of um, pages and URLs is cyclic. That is, if you're not careful, um, you may end up following, if you don't remember, oh, I've already fetched this web page already, you may end up following cycles forever and you know, your crawler will never finish. So one of the jobs of the crawler is to remember the set of pages that it's already crawled or already even started a fetch for and to not start a second fetch for um, any page that it's already started fetching on. And you can think of that as sort of imposing a tree structure, finding a sort of tree-shaped subset of the cyclic graph of actual um, web pages. Um, okay, so we wanna avoid cycles. We wanna be able to um, not fetch a page twice. It also, it turns out that it just takes a long time to fetch a web page, both because servers are slow and because the network has a long speed of light latency. Um, and um, so you definitely don't want to fetch pages one at a time unless you want the crawl to take many years. Um, and so it pays enormously to fetch many pages at the same time, up to some limit. Right? You want to keep on increasing the number of pages you fetch in parallel until the throughput you're getting in pages per second stops increasing, that is, you want to increase the concurrency until you run out of um, network capacity. So we want to be able to launch multiple fetches in parallel. And a final challenge, which um, is sometimes the hardest thing to solve, is to know when the crawl is finished. Right? Once we've crawled all the pages, we want, to, we want to stop and say we're done. But we actually need to write the code to realize, aha, um, we've crawled every single page. And for some solutions I've tried, the figuring out when you're done has turned out to be the hardest part. Um, all right, so my first crawler is this serial crawler here. And by the way, this code is available on the website under crawler.go on the schedule if you want to look at it. Um, this first crawl is a serial crawler. Um, it effectively pre performs a depth first search into the web graph. Um, and um, there is sort of one moderately interesting thing about it it keeps this map called fetched, which is basically using as a set in order to remember which pages it's crawled. Um, and that's like the only interesting part of this. You give it a URL, um, that at line 18, if it's already fetched the URL, it just returns. Um, if it hasn't fetched the URL, it first remembers that it, it's now fetched it. Um, actually gets, fetches that page um, and extracts the URLs that are in the page with the fetcher and then iterates over the URLs in that page and calls itself. Um, for every one of those pages. And it passes to itself the way it, it really has just the one table. There's only one fetched map, um, of course, because you know, when I call a recursive crawl and it fetches a bunch of pages, after it returns, I wanna be aware, uh, you know, the outer crawl instance needs to be aware that 
certain pages are already fetched. So we depend very much on the fetched map being passed between the functions by reference instead of by copying. So, it, so under the hood, what must really be going on here is that Go is passing a pointer to the map object um, to, to each of the calls of crawl, so they all share a pointer to the same object in memory rather than copying, um, rather than copying the map. Any questions? All right, so this code definitely does not solve the problem that was posed, right? Because it doesn't launch parallel, uh, um, parallel fetches. Now, so clearly we need to insert Go routines somewhere in this code, right, to get parallel fetches. So let's suppose, just for chuckles, um, that we just start with the most lazy thing, because why? Uh, hmm. Um, so I'm going to just modify the code to run the subsidiary crawls each in its own Go routine. Um, actually, before I do that, why don't I run the code just to show you what correct output looks like? So open this other window. I'm going to um, run the crawler. It actually runs all three copies of the crawler, and they all find exactly the same set of uh, web pages. So this is the output that we're hoping to see. Five lines, uh, five different web pages are. Uh, or fetched, prints a line for each one. So let me now um, run the subsidiary crawls in their own Go routines and run that code. So what am I going to see? The hope is to fetch these web pages in parallel for higher performance. So, OK, so you're voting for only seeing one URL. And why, so why is that? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, after the, um, after the, it's not going to wait in this loop at line 26. It's going to zip right through that loop. Um, well, it's going to fetch one page, one, the very first web page at line 22. And then in that loop, it's going to fire off the Go routines. And immediately, this crawl function is going to return. And if it was called from main, main will just exit almost certainly before any of the Go routines was able to do any work at all. So we'll probably just see the first web page. Um, and indeed, when I run it, um, You'll see here under serial that only uh, the one web page was found. Now, in fact, since this program doesn't exit after the serial crawler, those Go routines are still running. And they actually print their output down here, um, interleaved with the next crawler example. But nevertheless, um, the codes um, just adding a Go here absolutely doesn't work. Um, so let's get rid of that. OK, so now I want to show you. Uh, one style of concurrent crawler. And I'm presenting two, one of them written with um, shared data, shared objects and locks. It's the first one. Um, and another one written without shared data, but with uh, passing information along channels in order to coordinate the different threads. So this is the shared data one. Um, or this is just one of many ways of building a web crawler using shared data. So this code is significantly more complicated than the serial crawler. Um, it creates a, uh, a thread for each fetch it does, all right. But the huge difference is that it does um, well, two things. One, it, it does the bookkeeping required to notice when all of the crawls have finished. Um, and it handles the shared table of which URLs have been crawled correctly. So this code still has this uh, table of URLs, and that's this f.fetched um, f.fetched map at line 43. Um, and, but this, uh, this table is actually shared by all of the um, all of the crawler threads. And all of the crawler threads are making are executing inside concurrent mutex. And so we still have this sort of tree of concurrent mutexes that's exploring different parts of the web graph. But each one of them was launched as, a, um, as its own Go routine instead of as a function call. Um, but they're all sharing this table of state, this table of fetched URLs. Because if one Go routine fetches a URL, we don't want another Go routine to accidentally fetch the same uh, URL. And as you can see here, line 42 and 45, I've surrounded them by the mutexes that are required to, um, uh, to prevent a race. 
that would occur if I didn't have the mutexes. So the danger here is that at line 43, um, a thread is checking if a URL has already been fetched. So if two threads happen to be following the same URL, you know, two calls to concurrent mutex um, end up looking at the same URL, maybe because that URL was mentioned in two different web pages. Um, if we didn't have the lock, they'd both uh, access the map table to see if the thread had been already, if the URL had been already fetched, and they both get false at line 43. They both set the URLs entry in the table to true at line 44. And at 47, they would both see that it already was false, and then they'd both go on to fetch the web page. So we need the lock there. Um, and the way to think about it, I think, is that we want lines 43 and 44 to be atomic. That is, we don't want some other thread to, to get in and be using the table between 43 and 44. We, we want to read the current content. Each thread wants to read the current table contents and update it um, without any other thread interfering. And so that's what the locks are doing for us. Um, OK, so, so any, actually, any questions about the, about the locking strategy here? All right, once we've checked the URL's entry in the table, um, line 51, it just crawls it, just fetches that page in the usual way. Um, and then the other th interesting thing that's going on is the launching of the threads. Yes? Does the view have to be associated with an object? Like here it's like f.view, or like on the board over there, you just put like view.lock to the static like end.view. Like oh, so the question is what's with the f dot? Like, on does it have to be associated with the No. No, the mu, it is, OK. So there's a structure defined at line 36 that sort of collects together all the different stuff that, um, all the different state that we need to run this crawl. And here it's only two objects, but it, you know, it could be a lot more. And they're only grouped together for convenience. There's no other significance to the fact, there's no deep significance to the fact that mu and fetched are inside the same structure. Um, and that f dot is just sort of the syntax for getting at one of the elements in the structure. So I just happened to put the mu in the structure because it allows me to group together all the stuff related to a crawl. But that absolutely does not mean that Go associates the mu with that structure or with the fetch map or anything. It's just a lock object. And it just has a locked function you can call, and that's all that's going on. Yeah. So what are those? So the question is, how come in order to pass something by reference, I had to use star here, whereas when I, in the previous example, when we were passing a map, we didn't have to use star. That is, didn't have to pass a pointer. I mean, that star notation you're seeing there in you know, line 41, basically and, um, is saying that we're passing a pointer to this fetch state object. And we want it to be a pointer, because we want there to be one object in memory and all the different Go routines want to use that same object, so they all need a pointer to that same object. So, um, so when you define your own structure, that's sort of the syntax you use for passing a pointer. The reason why we didn't have to do it with map is because, although it's not clear from the syntax, a map is a pointer. It just, because it's built into the language, they don't make you put a star there. But what a map is, is, um, you know, if you acquire a variable type map, what that is is a pointer to some data in the heap. And so it was a pointer anyway, and it's always passed by reference. They, you just don't have to put the star, and it does it for you. So there, there's there definitely map is special. You cannot define map in the language. It's, it has to be built in, because there's some curious things about it. OK. Good. OK, so we fetched the page. Now we want to fire off a crawl Go routine for each URL mentioned in the page we just fetch. Um, so that's done in line 56. And line 56 just loops over the URLs that the fetch function returned. And for each one, fires off a Go routine at line 58. And that lines, that func syntax in line 58 um, is a closure or a sort of immediate function. What that func thing keyword is doing is declaring a function right there that we then call. 
Um, so the way to read it maybe is um, that if you can declare a function as a piece of data as just func, you know, and then you give the arguments, and then you give the body, um, and that declares, and so this is an object now. This is like, um, it's like when you type one, when you have a one or a 23 or something, um, you're declaring a sort of constant object. And this is the way to define a constant function. And um, we do it here because we want to launch a Go routine that's going to run this function that we declared right here. And so we, in order to make the Go routine, we have to add a Go in front to say we want a Go routine. And then we have to call the function because the Go syntax says, the syntax of the Go keyword says you follow it by a function name and the arguments you want to pass to that function. And so we're going to pass some arguments here. Um, and um, there's two reasons we're doing this. Well, really, there's one reason. We, you know, I, in some other circumstance, we could have just said go concurrent mutex. Right? Concurrent mutex is the name of the function we actually want to call with this URL. Um, but we want to do a few other things as well. So we define this little helper function that first calls concurrent mutex for us with the URL. Um, and then, after concurrent mutex is finished, we do something special in order to help us wait for all the crawls to be done um, before the outer function returns. So that brings us to the, um, the wait group. The wait group at line 55, it's a, just a data structure defined by Go to help with um, coordination. And the game with wait group is that internally it has a counter, um, and you call wait group dot add like a line 57 to increment the counter, um, and wait group dot done to decrement it, and then this wait, this wait method call at line 63 waits for the counter to, to get down to zero. So a wait group is a way to um, wait for a specific number of things to finish. Um, and it's useful in a bunch of different situations. Here we're using it to wait for the last go routine to finish, because um, we add one to the wait group for every go routine we create. Um, Line 60 at the end of this function we've declared decrements the counter in the wait group. Um, and then line three waits until all the decrements have finished. Um, and so the reason why we declared this little function was basically to be able to both call concurrent mutex and call done. That's really why we needed that function. Yes? So the question is, what if one of the subroutines fails and doesn't reach the done line? That's a darn good question. Um, there is, you know, if, I forget the exact range of errors that will cause the Go routine to fail without causing the program to fail. Maybe it divides by zero. I don't know, or dereferences a nil pointer. I'm not sure. But there are certainly ways for a function to fail and have the Go routine die without having the program die. And that would be a problem for us. And so really the right, right way to, I'm sure you had this in mind when asking the question, the right way to write this, to be sure that the done call is made no matter why this go routine is finishing, would be to um, put a defer here, which means call done before the surrounding function finishes. And always call it no matter why the surrounding function is finishing. Yes. So I see up there we have a done dot add and then done dot done. So I don't exactly know the inner workings of done. Um, but, but are we assuming done is, is, is itself uh, in say, say Yes. Yeah, so the question is how come the two uses of done in different threads aren't a race? Um, yeah. Yeah, so the answer must be that internally done, the, uh, a wait group has a mutex or something like it um, that each of Dunn's methods acquires before doing anything else so that simultaneous calls to a, a, Dunn, to a wait group's methods oh, aren't raised. Wait group is a, a go class. Wait group is a go class. Yeah, for certainly for C++ and in uh, C you want to look at something called pthreads. For C, threads come in a library, they're not really part of the language. 
called p-threads, which they have. I mean, these are extremely traditional and ancient uh, primitives that all languages have. Sorry, hang on. <laughs> yeah. Say it again. Would you ever want to increment by more than one? You know, yeah, not in this code, but you know, you could imagine a use of weight groups. I mean, weight groups just count stuff. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Weight group doesn't really care what you're counting or why. Yeah. Um, I mean, th th you know, this is the most common way to see it used. But. You're wondering why u is passed as a parameter to the function at 58? Yeah, because u takes on all the, uh, okay. all the URLs. Yeah, this is, all right, so the question is, um, okay, so actually backing up a little bit. The rules for these, um, uh, for a function like the one I'm defining on 58 is that if the function body mentions a variable that's declared in the outer function but not shadowed, then the, the inner function's use of that is the same variable in the inner function as in the outer function. Um, and so that's what's happening with uh, um, fetcher, for example. Like, what does this variable here refer to? What does the fetcher variable refer to in the inner function? Well, it refers, it's the same variable as, as the fetcher in the outer function. So it's, it just is that variable. And so when the inner function refers to fetcher, it just means it's just it's referring to the same variable as this one here. Um, and the same with f. f is it's used here, it's just, just is this variable. So you might think that we could get rid of the, uh, um, this u argument that we're passing and just have the inner function take no arguments at all but just use the u that was defined up on line 56 in the loop. Um, and it would be nice if we could do that because it would save us some typing. Um, it turns out not to work. And the reason is that the semantics of go of the for loop at line 56 is that the for loop updates the variable u. So in the first iteration of the for loop, that variable u contains some URL. Um, and when you enter the second iteration of the for loop, that variable's contents are changed to be the second URL. And that means that the first go routine that we launched that's just looking at the outer, if it were looking at the outer function's u variable, the, that first go routine we launched would see a different value in the u variable after the outer function had updated it. And sometimes that's actually what you want. So for example, for, for um, f, and in particular f.fetched, we, inner function absolutely wants to see changes to that map. Um, but for u, we don't want to see changes. The first go routine we spawn should read the first URL, not the second URL. So we want that Go routine to have a copy, have its own private copy of the URL. And you know, just, we could have done it in other ways. We could have, but the way this code happens to do it, to produce the copy private to that inner function is by passing the URL as an argument. Yes? If you had a pointer to a string, then would it still point to the same? Yeah, if we had passed the address of u, yeah, then. Um, it, it, uh, it's, um, actually, I don't know how strings work, but it is absolutely giving you your own private copy of, this, of the variable. <laughs> you get your own copy of the variable, and it, yeah. Yeah. I guess with immutable types, Are you saying we don't need to play this trick in the code? <laughs> we definitely need to play this trick in the code. And what's going on is, this, it's, so, so the question is, oh, strings are immutable. Strings are immutable, right? Yeah. So how come if strings are immutable, how can the outer function change the string? There should be no problem. 
the problem is not that the string is changed. The problem is that the variable u is changed. So the, wh when the inner function mentions a variable that's defined in the outer function, it's referring to that variable and the variable's current value. And so when you, if you have a string variable that has, has a in it, and then you assign b to that string variable, you're not overwriting the string. You're changing the variable to point to a different string. And, and, and because the for loop changes the u variable to point to a different string, you know, that change to u would be visible inside the inner function. And therefore, the inner function needs its own copy of the variable. So my, my follow-up question is, like, any immutable types, as far as I know, whenever you call a function of them and you pass them as their own arguments, they'll essentially make a copy of that so that, like, even if the variable at that pointer got changed, at that location got changed, your own copy does not get Okay, but that is what we're doing in this code, and it's, that is why this code works. Okay, the proposal, or the broken code that we're not using here, I will show you the broken code. I think I can, I can hold. I think what's happening is Go sees that you escapes the context of context, concurrent context, and it puts it on the heap. So in this case, you is actually on the heap now. So it doesn't get, it's not on the stack. So, but if you make it an argument, it's no longer on the heap because it doesn't escape the context of concurrent mutex. And that's why you actually do get a copy when you make an argument. So the static analysis of Go, if you take you out of the argument, we'll put it on the heap instead. The, the, I mean, the, this is just like a horrible detail, but it is unfortunately one that you'll run into while doing the labs. Um, so you should be at least aware that there's a problem, and when you run into it, maybe you can try to figure out the details. Yeah? What happens if a Go routine references a variable from the outer scope that's not being overshadowed, and the outer scope returns? Like, if you remove <laughs> dot dot wait, how does Fetcher get resolved if the outer function goes out of the okay. that, That's a great question. So, uh, um, so the question is, you know, if you have an inner function, I just to repeat it, if you have an inner function that refers to a variable in the surrounding function, but the surrounding function returns, what is the inner function's variable referring to anymore since the outer function is, has returned? And the answer is that Go notices, Go analyzes your inner functions. Your, these are called closures. Um, Go analyzes them, the compiler analyzes them, says, aha, oh, this, this closure, this inner function is using a variable in the outer function. We're actually gonna, and the compiler will allocate heap memory to hold the variable, the, you know, the current value of the variable, and both functions will refer to that, the little area of heap um, that has the variable. So it won't be allocated, the variable won't be on the stack, as you might expect, it's moved to the heap if, if the compiler sees that it's used in a closure. And then when the outer function returns, the object is still there in the heap, the inner function can still get at it, and then the garbage collector is responsible for noticing that the last function to refer to this little piece of heap is exit it, that's returned, and to free it only then. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so weight group. <laughs> um, weight group is maybe the more important thing here. The, the, the technique that this code uses to wait for all, the, all this level of crawls to have finished, all its direct children to finish is the weight group. Um, and of course, there's many of these weight groups, one per call to concurrent mutex, each call the concurrent mutex just waits for its own children to finish and then returns. Um, okay, so um, back to the lock. Actually, there's one more thing I wanna talk about with the lock, and that is to explore what would happen if we hadn't locked, right? I'm claiming, oh, you know, you don't lock, you're gonna get these races, you're gonna get incorrect execution, whatever. Um, let's, let's give it a shot. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna comment out the locks and the question is, what happens if I run the code with no locks? What am I going to see? So we might see a, a URL call twice, or a fetch twice. Yeah, that's, yeah, that would be the error you'd, you might expect. All right, so I'll run it without locks. And we're looking at the concurrent map, the one in the middle. Well, this time, it doesn't seem to have fetched anything twice. It's only five. Run it again. Gosh, still five. Jeez. 
Yeah. So maybe we're wasting our time with those locks. Yeah, it never seems to go wrong. I've actually never seen it go wrong. Um, so the code is nevertheless wrong. <laughs> and someday it will fail. <laughs> okay? the, the problem is that you know, this is only a couple of instructions here. And so the chances of, oh, these two threads, which are maybe hundreds of instructions happening to stumble on this, you know, the same couple of instructions at the same time um, is quite low. Um, and indeed, and, and this is a real bummer about buggy code with races, is that it usually works just fine. Um, but it probably won't work when the customer runs it on their computer. Um, <laughs> so it's actually bad news for us, right? What do we, you know, it, it can be in complex programs quite difficult to figure out if you have a race, right? And you, might, you may have code that just looks completely reasonable that is, in fact, sort of unknown to you using shared variables. Um, and the answer is you really, the only way to find races in practice to be, um, is to use automated tools. And luckily, Go actually gives us this pretty good race detector um, built into Go, and, and you should use it. So if you um, pass the minus race flag when you execute your Go program, it'll run this race detector, which, um, well, I'll run the race detector and we'll see. So it emits an error message from us. It's found a race. And it actually tells us exactly where the race happened. So there's a lot of junk in this output, but the really critical thing is that um, the race detector realized that we had read a variable, that's what this read is, that was previously written, and there was no intervening release and acquire of a lock. That's what, that's what this means. Furthermore, it tells us the line number. So it's told us that the read was at line 43, and the write the previous right was at line 44. And indeed, we look at the code, and the read is at line 43, and the right is at line 44. So that means that one thread did a write at line 44, and then, without any intervening lock, another thread came along and read that written data um, at line 43. And that's basically what the race detector is looking for. Um, the way it works internally is it allocates sort of shadow memory. It allocates some you know, it uses a huge amount of memory, and basically for every one of your memory locations, the race detector has allocated a little bit of memory itself in which it keeps track of which threads recently read or wrote every single memory location. And then when, an, and it also keep tracking, keeping track of when threads acquire and release locks and do other synchronization activities that um, it knows forces, would force threads to not run concurrently. And if the race detector ever sees, aha, there was a memory location that was writ written and then read, with no intervening lock, it, um, it'll raise an error. Yes? Do you think it doesn't detect any races? Any races? Does that mean no race conditions? Like, is it perfect? Um, I believe it is not perfect. Um, it, uh, um, yeah, I have to think about it. But um, um, one, one, certainly one way it is not perfect is that if you, if you don't execute some code, the race detector doesn't know anything about it. So it's not analyzing, it's not doing static analysis. The race detector is not looking at your source and making decisions based on the source. It's sort of watching what happened at, on this particular run of the program. And so if this particular run of the program didn't execute some code th that happens to read or write shared data, then the race detector will never know, and there could be a race there. So that's certainly something to watch out for. So you know, if you're serious about the race detector, you need to set up sort of testing apparatus that tries to make sure all, um, all the code is executed. Um, but it, it's, it's very good, and you just have to use it for your 824 labs. Um, OK, so there's this race here. Um, and of course, the, the race didn't actually occur. What the race detector did not see was the actual interleaving simultaneous execution of some sensitive code. Right? It didn't see two threads literally execute lines 43 and 44 at the same time. Um, and as we know from having run the things by hand, that apparently doesn't happen, or at least with, only with low probability. All it saw was that at one point there was a write, and then maybe much later there was a read with no intervening lock. Um, and so in that, in that sense, it can sort of detect races that didn't actually happen or didn't really cause bugs. Okay. Um, 
Okay, one final question about this, uh, this crawler. Um, how many threads does it create? And how many concurrent threads could there be? And, uh, and, well, I guess more than that, because if yeah. I can replace that with that and then find out it's already. Yeah. yeah. So a, a defect in this crawler is that there's no obvious bound on the number of simultaneous threads it might create. You know, and with the test case, which only has five URLs, you know, big whoopee. But if you're crawling a real, real web with, you know, I don't know, are there billions of URLs out there? Maybe. Um, we certainly don't want to be in a position where the crawler might accidentally create billions of threads um, because, you know, thousands of threads is just fine, billions of threads is not okay because um, each one sits on some amount of memory. So, uh, you know, there's probably many defects in real life with this crawler, but um, one at the level we're talking about is that it does create too many threads and really ought to have a way of saying, well, you can create 20 threads or 100 threads or 1,000 threads, but no more. So one way to do that would be to pre-create a pool, a fixed size pool of workers, and have the workers just iteratively, oh, look for another URL to crawl, crawl that URL, rather than creating a new uh, thread for each URL. Okay, so next up I wanna talk about a, um, another crawler that's implemented in um, a significantly different way using channels instead of shared memory. So remember on the uh, mutex crawler I just said, there is this table of URLs that are crawled that's shared between all the threads and has to be locked. Um, this version does not have such a table, um, does not share memory, and does not need to use locks. <laughs> um, okay, so this one, the, instead, there's basically a master thread that says master function on 86, line 86, and it has a table, but the table is private to the master function. And what the master function is doing is um, instead of sort of basically creating a tree of functions that corresponds to the exploration of the graph, which the previous crawler did, this one fires off just one, U one go routine per URL that it fetches, and that, but it's only the master, only the one master um, that's creating these threads. So we don't have a tree of functions creating threads, we just have the one master. Um, Okay, so it creates its own private map at line 88. This will record what it's fetched. And then um, it also creates a channel, just a single channel um, that all of its worker threads are gonna talk to. And the idea is that it's gonna fire up a worker thread um, and each worker thread that it fires up, when it finishes fetches, fetching the page, will send exactly one item back to the master on the channel. And that item will be a list of the URLs in the page that that worker thread fetched. Um, so the master sits in a loop where in line 89, um, it's reading entries from the channel. And so we have to imagine that it's um, started up some workers in advance, and now it's reading the information, the URL list that those workers send back. Um, and each time it gets a URL list at 80, on line 89, it then loops over the URLs in that URL list um, from a single page fetch at line 90, um, and if the URL hasn't already been fetched, um, it fires off a new worker at line 94 to fetch that URL. And if we look at the worker code on line, starting at line 77, basically calls this fetcher, um, and then sends a message on the channel at line 80 or 82 saying, here's the URLs in the page that I fetched. Um, and notice now that the, the maybe the interesting thing about this is that the worker threads uh, don't share any objects. There's no shared object between the workers and the master, so we don't have to worry about locking. We don't have to worry about races. Um, and instead, this is a, an example of uh, sort of communicating information instead of getting at it through shared memory. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the observation is um, that the code appears, well, the workers are, the observation is the workers are modifying CH while the master's reading it. Um, and um, um, 
that's not the way the Go authors would like you to think about this. Um, the way they want you to think about this is that CH is a channel, and the channel has send and receive operations, um, and the workers are sending on the channel while the master receives on the channel, and that's perfectly legal. The channel is happy. I mean, what that really means is that the internal implementation of channel has a mutex in it, and the channel operations are careful to take out the mutex when they're messing with the channel's internal data to ensure that it doesn't actually have any races in it. Um, but yeah, channels are sort of protected against concurrency, and you're allowed to use them concurrently from different threads. Yes? I see that uh, to break out of the for loop over the channel receive things, uh, we have a break statement. If yes. If we want to do it without this break statement, we would need to, how would we explicitly close the channel? We don't need to close the channel. I mean, the, the, okay, the, the break statement is about when the crawl has completely finished and we fetched every single URL, right? Because, I mean, what's going on is the master is keeping, I mean, it's a, this n value is a private value, um, and the master, every time it fires off a worker, it increments the n. The, every worker it starts sends exactly one item on the channel, and so every time the master reads an item off the channel, it knows that one of his workers is finished, and when the number of outstanding workers goes to zero, um, then we're done. And we don't, once the number of outstanding workers goes to zero, then the only reference to the channel is from the master or from the, or really from the code that calls the master. And so the garbage collector will very soon see that the channel has no references to it and will free the channel. And so in this case, sometimes you need to close channels, but actually I rarely have to close channels. Um, good question. Can you say it again? Like if you call master with, with mapping on the channel, like does it skip the for a loop? Oh, so the question is, all right, so you can see at line 106, um, before calling master, concurrent channel sort of uh, fires up one, shoves one URL into the channel. Um, and to, to sort of get the whole thing started, because the code for master is written, you know, the master goes right into reading from the channel at line 89. So there better be something in the channel, otherwise line 89 would block forever. So if it weren't for that little code at line 107, the for loop at 89 would block reading from the channel forever, and this the code wouldn't work. Well, you, yeah. So the observation is, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to write code that would be able to notice if there's nothing waiting on the channel? And you can. If you look up the select statement, it's much more complicated than this, but there is the select statement which allows you to proceed to not block if, if, something, if there's nothing waiting on the channel. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a um, for loop in line 89 that loops over uh, the object that we see in the channel, right? So let's assume that the URL that we're fetching is really big and the fetch itself takes a very long time. Uh, when we launch the worker thread in line 94, then we go afterwards, we still haven't received anything in our channel from the worker. When we reach uh, line 101 and we check for anything else left in the channel again, there's nothing there. Because the worker hasn't finished. Because the worker hasn't finished. And yeah. it also, doesn't this create concurrency issues? Because like in Java, Changing uh, a list while you're in a for loop will create a concurrency exception. Okay, sorry. To the first question, um, is there? So I think what you're really worried about is whether we're actually able to launch parallel. So the, the very first fetch it won't be in parallel because at first, there, you know. What I'm worried is that we don't receive the results uh, soon. We don't receive the results as fast as enough that we're checking to see if there are any results left so it should stay listening. When we check in line 89 to see if there's anything left in the channel, we've already sent, we've already launched a worker. The worker is trying, but we see nothing in the channel, it, it, so the for loop exits. No, no, it doesn't exit. Oh, no, 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 the, the for loop waits in, at line 89. That's not, okay. That for loop at line 89 is, does not just loop over the current contents of the channel and then quit. 
That is, the for loop at 89 is going to read, it may never exit. <laughs> it's going to read, it's just going to keep waiting until something shows up in the channel. So if you don't hit the break at line 99, the for loop won't exit. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, we'll continue this, actually, we have a, um, a presentation scheduled by the TAs, which I'll talk more about Go.